In this lecture, we will talk about flow tracing and watershed analysis. We will describe the cumulative terrain parameters and those are parameters that are derived from flow tracing procedures. We will describe methods that are used to compute these parameters and then we will talk about the problem of flow tracing through depressions and we will finish with watersheds and watershed extraction. So what are cumulative flow parameters? These are parameters that, I, that are based on flow tracing and they are cumulative, that means that they do not characterize topography in a single point, but over certain area or over certain length along the flow path. And among them are flow path length, then flow accumulation that can be used to extract stream networks, and then related to flow accumulation are watersheds and ridge lines. So what are flow lines? Flow lines are lines that follow gradient direction and we already talked about what gradient is. This is a vector that follows steepest slope. And they are these lines are perpendicular to contours. And here you can see few of these flow lines uh, as they are generated from these points, from centers of grid points. So you can see that they are perpendicular to contours and they follow the steepest slope. Now what is flow direction? We already said that the flow lines follow gradient direction so of course the flow direction will be gradient direction. And how do we compute it? There are, we already talked about several ways how to compute gradient. And here we will talk about two different methods that are used for specifically for flow tracing. The simplest method is so-called D8 algorithm. This algorithm uses only eight directions. That means that it essentially represents aspect or gradient direction, which is discretized to eight directions only. That means 0, 45, 90 degrees. And it is estimated from elevation differences between the given grid cell and its neighboring cells. So for example, is this, if this is a given grid cell and we are trying to find what would be the flow direction from this grid cell, we compare the difference in elevation between this grid cell and all the other cells until we find one grid cell where this difference is the largest and that would be the steepest slope direction. Now the the D8 algorithm is of course very restricted because it recognizes only eight directions. If we want more accurate, more refined, uh, more detailed flow direction, we will use the infinity algorithm or vector grid algorithm, which uses a floating point value of aspect. And we already talked about how to estimate aspect using various approximation functions and we have uh, worked with polynomial approximation which essentially used uh, or led to weighted differences from 3 per 3 grid neighborhood or we have used um, aspect or flow direction or gradient direction using derivatives computed from a spline function. And then you can see that here the, the vectors, the orientation in, in, in vectors can have many more than just eight directions. And then what, where this is useful, when we want to trace flow using vector representation, when we really want to generate um, vector lines 
at a greater detail than just having it jump only in eight directions. So then here is an example of such flow line. So now how do we do flow routing? Flow routing involves tracing flow in the gradient direction and we use it to compute flow path length and flow accumulation. So what is flow path length? Flow path length is the length of flow line from any given cell to the outlet and we use this to compute time that is needed for water or for mass to reach outlet of the watershed from this given cell. And if we trace this flow from the cell which is farthest from the outlet, we can compute time to concentration or time that it takes from water from all grid cells in the given watershed to reach outlet and then we talk about steady state flow and we will describe steady state flow in more detail when we talk about flow accumulation and also next week when we will be talking about hydrologic modeling. Then, uh, then we can also define flow path length the other way as hill slope length and that would be from any given cell upslope to a flat or a depression. And this kind of hill slope length is used for erosion modeling using universal soil loss equation. And again, we will be talking about this parameter next week when we talk about erosion modeling. So here is the spatial distribution of flow path length either measured as the distance to the outlet or as the distance from the bot as the length of the hill slope. So the distance to the outlet is represented on this map and it is computing uh, computed as a length of this flow path from each grid cell to the outlet. And you can see that of course the grid cells that are all the way on the ridge have the longest flow path or flow length to the outlet of the watershed which is here. And then the hill slope length is computed from each grid cell upslope and we trace flow all the way up to the ridge. So, so these slopes are rather long while we have couple hill slopes which are relatively short, for example here. And this is important for modeling soil erosion because it measures how much water will be on these hill slopes coming all the way or accumulating all the way from the, uh, from the top of the ridge. So now what is fl flow accumulation? So the previously we just measured the length along single flow line. Now what we can do, we can compute number of flow lines that pass through each grid cell. And then this essentially represents number of cells that drain into any given cell. And it also represents size of the upslope contributing area. So for example, flow accumulation here represents the number of grid cells that flow from upstream into this grid cell. So it will be from all of these, all of these will be flowing here. And that means that this number actually will represent the contributing area to this grid cell. And here you can see in three dimensions what it actually means. So you can see that the water accumulates in the valleys and the 
contributing area increases as we are getting closer to the outlet. So at any point we can say that the contributing area will be represented by the number of cells that drain into this point and it will be something like this. And what this means, it's the measure of steady state flow depth. So it has a direct relation to the overland flow. And you can also see on this three-dimensional map that this is essentially a distribution of the amount of water that would be flowing through this watershed. So there would be no water on the ridges and all water will be accumulating in the valley with the maximum amount here in the outlet. And here is the dynamics. So here you can see how this flow accumulation evolves. So here we are computing the density after certain number, after each flow line passes certain number uh, of cells. So now, how can we do this flow routing? There are several methods how to do the, how to do the flow routing and how to essentially uh, accumulate flow over the topography. Uh, there are two basic approaches in terms of using the distributing water as it flows downslope. One method is so-called single flow direction which moves entire unit of flow or entire amount of water that falls on one grid cell into a single downslope cell. What does that mean? So when, we, when water converges in concave areas, we are fine. The, the water will be just added in discrete numbers cell by cell. But if we have water flow dispersal on convex slopes, and we have already shown how that looks like when we were talking about uh, uh, terrain geometry, then the amount of water decreases when you go down slope, and that cannot be captured with this single flow direction algorithm. And you will see various artifacts, artificial flow patterns on these convex hill slopes. But this can be handled by multiple flow direction algorithms, which partition flow into two or more downslope directions. So most water will be coming, will be going into the uh, gradient direction in the direction of gradient but there will be also smaller amounts of water redirected to the cells that have lower elevation but they are not in the direction of gradient they are not in the steepest slope direction and that allows to model dispersal flow and both of these flow routing methods can be implemented either with DA or with the infinity. So we can either use 45 degree aspect or we can use more uh, refined uh, representation of aspect. So the biggest differences between single flow and multiple flow uh, routing are on high resolution digital elevation models. And here you can see our one meter resolution digital elevation model and the result of single flow D8 algorithm. So you can see that on these hill slopes, we have rather artificial uh, flow routing all in the direction uh, of uh, either in the direction of grid cells or in the direction of grid cell diagonals with these 45 degrees, uh, 45 degrees steps. We can improve the realism or uh, the accuracy of flow routing by using the infinity, by using more accurate gradient direction and then flow accumulation 
will look like this. And then if we use multiple flow direction, you can see that this allows the flow accumulation to spread in those areas uh, where we have multiple uh, cells with lower elevation. So you will have this broader, wider uh, water flow patterns when you use multiple flow direction. We can also do flow routing using a uniform source or weighted source. And with uniform source, we assume that, it, that there is same amount of rainfall falling on each grid cell. So one unit is rooted from each cell. With weighted approach, each cell is assigned weight that is proportional to amount of water it produces. So this allows spatially variable rainfall access or spatially variable source of water flow accumulation. And this is how the results will, how it will influence the results. Here we have water flow accumulation from our 30 meter uh, resolution digital elevation model using single flow direction D8 algorithm. And you can see that at least at this lower resolution, we are getting quite realistic, quite nice spatial pattern of flow accumulation. Then we can introduce impact of land use and distinguish the amount of water that is coming from developed areas, which are here in orange, and from forested and agricultural areas, which are here in green and yellow. So we can generate the weights which will represent the rainfall excess or the amount of water in each grid cell that is available for flow routing. And you can see that in these developed areas we have uh, assigned much higher weight. And then we can generate flow accumulation map. And in this flow accumulation map you can see that we have higher values of water flow accumulation here in the developed areas, but also in the streams that are flowing from these developed areas. So for example, here, the, the stream that is flowing out of here has higher value of water flow accumulation than the stream here. And we would need a little bit tuned up, uh, more tuned up uh, color table to highlight this. Uh, the water flow accumulation can be also used for stream extraction and we will talk about that in the next section.